Hey everyone, it's Ra, your life experiences with Ra, and today I'm here with another amazing soul, Cheryl Mays. Cheryl is from right in the United States, in Orlando, Florida. Cheryl, yes. how are you today? I am doing fabulous. Well, you look fabulous as Thank usual. You. <laughs> I want you to tell my rosters because I call them my rosters. They are my fans, my followers, and I am raw, and they're my rosters. All right. <laughs> Cheryl, so you introduce yourself to everyone. Hello, rosters. My name is Cheryl Mays. As Ra said, I am from Orlando, Florida, and I have the opportunity to meet some incredible people this weekend, and you being one of them. Thank you. Uh, that's just been so impactful. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting when you asked me my story. Yes. And you said, what is your story? And it, it's, it's such an interesting question when people ask someone that because, you know, in life we have multiple stories. Yeah, we do have multiple stories. But the thing about the stories, what I do on mm -hmm. your life experiences with Raw, as I said, my motto is from where you were in life to where you are today. There is a place where you would have felt that it's a give up time. Mm -hmm. And most people go through that, even with studying kids mm -hmm. as teenagers. And we have so much kids attempting suicide or committing suicide because yeah. of the pressure of different places they are stuck. Mm -hmm. And humans are like that in adulthood as well, don't matter, throughout your entire life. And so mm -hmm. when I ask that question, what's your story? Because you are a powerful, strong woman. And to be that person you are today, you had to be somewhere that actually groomed you. And grooming don't come from university or school or coping with life. They do not teach you that, and we know that. You don't learn that in school. So something had to make you into the strong, beautiful person. You know, again, right, there's multiple experiences along the way. Yes. But here's what I, here's what I will share. Um, my family is a very close-knit family. So we're very close knit. I'm actually the youngest of three. Wow, nice. And the only girl. Only girls. So yeah. You have two elder brothers. Yes. Nice. And so no pressure there, right? <laughs> <laughs> I just said nice. <laughs> I, but you know what's so interesting is that my older brothers have these um, these really big personalities. Uh -huh. They're really, really big. Like one's really funny, the other one is just really so um, inviting, and mm -hmm. everybody just gravitates to them. And me, I was always just this, the shy in the background, you know, um, no voice, uh -huh. because I was competing with these massive personalities. Of course, right? And so I think that had a lot to do with my aspiring and in everything that I did. Yes. Right? I always had to be, I worked harder mm -hmm. to get myself to a place where I could not, I didn't have to compete to the personality. Nice. But I can compete to the achievement. Beautiful. And and that was really the the I guess the onset of how I got to where I am. Nice. It was just always achievements have been my huge huge element of success um, because I like to to see myself as a high achiever. Mm -hmm. um, I'm one of those individuals that uses the powers of the universe. I use the powers of my God, my faith is strong. Beautiful. And those are the things that allow me to say, you got this, girl. You got this. You yeah. got this. Just believe that you can. Oh, wow. You all hearing this? The same thing I tell you all, all the time. Believe you can, you shall, you will keep those going. Cheryl, what do you do? What do you do for... So it, it's interesting you say that because my story, uh -huh. um, as I share it, is really not about my trauma. Right. I grew into what I do. Right. I was literally birthed, as I say, into my profession. Oh. And so what I do is I'm a corporate trainer. Right. I have nice. a business. Beautiful. My business is called Rise and Shine. Rise and Shine. And my focus area is on customer service and customer experiences. Oh, that's a lot of patience. <laughs> You're really groomed. Trust me. <laughs> really. She's really groomed because anyone, no matter what it is, and then customer service. You could be working mm -hmm. at a store. You could be working, as you say, in corporate. And mm -hmm. customer service is 
one of the hardest things to deal with human beings. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. You know, and, and what's so interesting about it is there's a, there's, a, there's a much global aspect to customer service. And when I talk about it, people always think customer service is just about being nice and kind. But you know, there's, there's a business component mm -hmm. to customer service because it, it allows you to remain in business for years and years and years. Right. Because you're treating your customers with respect. Of course. You're allowing them to feel valued. And people want to be treated with respect. Yes. Right? You're spending your money someplace. You want people to appreciate your business. Uh-huh. You know, you don't want them to take advantage of you. You don't want them to mistreat you. You want to feel special. Of course, and you are special. I exactly, so, because we're all special individuals. Right, and when you know, just like I always say, you love yourself, and you know you are special, you treat people the same way you want to be treated, and that's the beautiful part. Exactly, that's the golden rule, exactly. right? Yeah, treat people it. the way you would like to be treated. Yes. Now, when you elevate that, right, then you have the platinum rule. Yes. It's treat people the way they want to be treated. Oh, nice. I love that. You all heard that. That's beautiful. Yeah. You know, because what that means is you go above and beyond. Mm. You go above and beyond. You make a person just feel so very special. But here's, here's how I got to that, though. Nice. I had, um, so I've been married mm -hmm. twice, so I'm two times divorced. Mm. My, second, my second marriage was really what catapulted me into starting my own business. And in 2014, I had, um, I had a corporate position where I was flying throughout the country. Every Monday, I was on a plane mm. going somewhere. Every Friday, I would come back. So I was literally home two days a week. Oh, boy. And I was going out training. I was training individuals. And at that time, I had gotten married, met a, met a guy that um, was a friend of a family member. And we got along well. And here's what's so funny, and this is what I will say to you, Rastas. <laughs> Love it. Sometimes you can be attracted for the wrong reasons. That's important. So put a pin right there. Be attracted because of the wrong reasons is not good. And so our reasoning was we were from the same hometown. Mm -hmm. Never met each other. We played at the same playground mm. as kids. Never met each other. He went to school with my cousin. He went to school with a best friend of mine. We never met each other. And so we've had all of these commonalities, and you think, ah, oh, this is my kindred spirit. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know that feeling. Go ahead. Right? It's like, this is my star-crossed lover. We're meant to be. Mm -hmm. And so we get married. What you don't realize is that you start to see patterns. And these patterns are patterns where you're like, there's just something a little off. Right. right? Something is just not quite right here. Um, and so there was this, you know, there was just always something going on. It was either, you know, um, my family was here too much, don't want your family around that much, or it was your friends are, you know, why are you going to see your friends? And, and so it was this period where I felt like he was trying to isolate me wow. from my family, from my friends, so that he could be the manipulative person that he was. Mm -hmm. And so we were married for the first year, and I started, you know, you just let things go. Mm -hmm. And you go, eh, it's weird, but okay, fine. And then you let the next one go. Yeah, okay, fine. And then you find that you're continuously making excuses. And you start saying things to your friends when they go, well, why aren't you guys coming? Oh, well, you know, we've been working late, and, you know, mm. he's tired, but it's really because he doesn't like my friends. Right because he doesn't want me to have friends. Hmm. And so I got tired of making excuses. And so I just stopped going. And I stopped going to places. And so then it got to be the point where, you know, even with my daughter, you know, why is she here all the time? Your daughter? Yes, my daughter. He's speaking about your daughter like that. Oh my God. Why is she here all the time? And then there was always, she left the windows open. She didn't do this, she didn't do that. And, and I'm like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> hey, what is wrong with this? And then there was the other thing, and some of you are probably going, oh my gosh, he's in my world, mm -hmm. right? When he can't keep a job. <laughs> and it's like every, right after the probationary period, then he would get a pink slip. Mm -hmm. So then he would get let go. But it was never his fault. 
It was always. Always. Right. <laughs> always. It's always your fault. Yes, I understand. It was and not even my fault. It was always the manager's fault because she's female. All right. And in, oh, the losing uh, the job part. Yes. yes. It will always be someone else's yes, fault. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and so here's what's so interesting in that dynamic is my role. I was a vice president of sales. Right. So I hired people all the time. And I would say, well, you know, let me help you with your interview process. Right. right? Let, me, let me help you because I, I know what people are looking for course, when right. they're hiring people. I'm your wife. Utilize my skill sets. Mm -hmm. I don't have to do that. Why would I do that? Mm -hmm. And it was just like, it was just something after something after something. So now we're into year three. So let's go. We're going to fast forward. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're going to go to year three. So year three, I really started seeing things and I was like, there's just something really, really wrong because now I'm seeing the dynamics with him and his family, mm. how he treats his mom and oh. his dad and you know, what he says about them and what he says about his sisters. And I'm like, you don't like closeness. You don't like family. And when we got into this relationship, I said, I am a, a family story. person. Yeah. You know, I value family. Mm -hmm. So I started seeing those things and those things just started creeping up. And at that time I had gotten laid off. So now I'm laid off, but I'm fine. Cause I've got, you know, money in the bank. I've got, you know, 401ks, I've got stocks. I've got all of this stuff that I can rely on right. until I decide what am I going to do? So I call that two years of walking through the wilderness right. Right, going, okay, so what am I going to do? What's my purpose? What, am, what is it that I'm supposed to be doing? So during that time, our relationship started to change and I'm starting to realize it's because I was the financier hmm. and I was the one paying for all the vacations and, you know, taking us to all of these places and buying this and buying that. And so when I stopped doing that, because now I'm very cautious right. as to how I'm spending, the dynamic started to change. Wow. And now I'm starting to see this ugliness, like this, this evilness is starting to come out. Right. And, I, and you, you know, when you think back to a relationship, the signs that you see are true signs. And let us not ignore those signs <laughs> because it's something that needs, you need to really think about it and not always go, well, what did I do? Well, you would believe this, right? That cutting you, but like you think about this, you tell me the story and I take a person mm -hmm. and put them as your husband because that person did that to me too. Mm -hmm. So you just take that person, I put that person as your husband to see this picture totally straight up. It's yeah. Like, go ahead. <laughs> and this is the natural progression. Yes. Right? So, so here we are now. So now we're in year three and he's starting to lose jobs more and more. It's like every six months. Mm -hmm. So it's like every six months I'm picking up your half of, you know, everything that you're responsible for. Right. So it's falling back on me. And so now that straining the relationship, mm -hmm. because in marriage is one of the number one reasons for divorce is always finances. Finance. I say that all the time. Yes. <laughs> right. And so now it's getting to the point where his, his true pattern mm. is starting to come out. The jealousy, Oof. the competition, <laughs> right? the isolation, the you did this. And, you know, I'm asking you a question about, well, you know, why did you, why did you park your car there where, you know, you know, it's easier for me yeah. to park my car there because your car is bigger than mine. Right, right. And then he would just do it purposely. Wow. And after that, it would just be purposely just to inconvenience me. And then we started just arguing about little stuff. Yep. Right? Like, why did you turn on the irrigation system? Because the grass is brown and we got a letter from the HOA mm -hmm. saying that you have to water the grass. Right. Well, I don't want to water the grass and don't you do that. And then it just kept going and it kept going and it kept going. So finally, um, I have a house that I purchased right. back in 1998. So when we got married, he relocated, came to Florida to live with me, moved into my house. And then all of a sudden he needed a bigger house. So he said, okay, fine. I'm trying to be a good wife. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, fine. So I rent my house out. So then we rented a house until we can find one that we wanted which again is just a sign from God to say, don't buy a house with this guy. Mm -hmm. So, so we rent the house. So it, it's interesting how it happens because you get a year lease, right. but now this last time something in my heart and in my mind said, don't get a year lease, just get a six month lease. Mm. 
And I don't know what it was that said that. It said, just get a six-month lease. Because I'm thinking, we're going to find a house within six months. We'll figure it out. So I get a six-month lease. So now we're in 2019. Right. And it's November. It's Thanksgiving. My mom decides to come for the holidays. So she comes for the holidays. And our relationship is just, we're not speaking. When we do, it's really short. Because now I can't say anything to you. Mm -hmm. Because your fuse is just that small right so I can't say anything to you because it's always like I'm attacking you if I even ask you a question right it's like how dare you question me I'm like Mm -hmm. what so it was uh December of 2019 I was done right I said okay listen I said after our lease is up which was now it's going to be up in 30 days that would have been the end of our six months I said after our lease is up we need a break yeah. I said, I'm going to go back to my house. You go find you a place to live. Right. You know, and let's just take a break, figure out what we want to do. So apparently that really Trump infuriated him. Yep. So now me being my progressive self, I go out, I'm going to get an apartment right. because I have renters in my home and their lease isn't up for another four or five months. Oh boy. So I said, okay, I'm just going to go get an apartment. So I go ahead. I put the money down on an apartment. I'm ready to go. Right, when the time comes, he realizes he can't afford to go anywhere. Yeah, because he has nothing. Exactly. Uh-huh. So now he gets really pissed. And so he just starts, um, you know, he just come in and just argue about something every single day, every single day. To whereas I would get nasty messages. I had gotten a job at a museum because uh-huh. I was always a fundraiser also. So I had gotten a job at a museum. And I, every morning I would wake up, I would get these nasty messages. F you, you did this, da 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 This was my morning at 7 a.m. So when I pull up to my job, I would always sit in the car and I would turn on a motivational podcast Mm -hmm. so that I can get into a good mindset before I go in here because I don't want to bring this drama into Into my work. work. Yes. So I'm sitting there and I'm listening to this podcast and the podcast goes off. The next podcast that comes up, it says, how do you know you're living with a narcissist? And I'm like, what's a narcissist? Mm. So I got a few more minutes before I have to go in. Google. So I listen. So I listen to the video. And I'm like, oh my goodness. (laughs) (laughs) I'm living with a narcissist. Yes, yes, yes. To the T, every single thing. Mm -hmm. The the lack of empathy. Mm Mm-hmm. The um, inability to accept that you are the reason why things are happening to you. Mm-hmm. The, the, um, the inability to understand that it's not always about you. Mm-hmm. And that you are literally the person that is responsible <laughs> for what's going on. With you. Right, with yeah. you. Right? And, there, and, you know, the other traits to the narcissism is that they have this superiority complex that they believe they're better than everyone else, not because of anything that they've accomplished, right. but just because they're better than just everybody naturally. else. naturally, yes. Right, yeah, just naturally. Because I'm like, you've, you've, you've got a degree, you've been into the military, why are you getting these really low-paying jobs? Mm-hmm. Right, because you, want to, you don't want to take on the responsibility. Right. So then I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the list of, of descriptions of narcissists and I'm saying, Okay, an inability to, to recognize others, manipulative, mm-hmm. gaslighting. I was like, what's this thing called gaslighting? Gaslighting, yeah. I mean, it's to make you believe that you've done something that you haven't. It's your fault, yeah. Right. And so these are the mind tricks that they play. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> because he would tell me things like, no, remember you said that. And I'm like, no, I didn't. Oh, God. <laughs> I told you, I just put the perfect person as your husband. I'm telling you. <laughs> right? So, and, and, and it makes you think, and you're like, maybe I'm going crazy. Oh, God. I'm telling you, this conversation had to happen. <laughs> and so you sit there, and you're like, I, something's wrong here. And, and I'm, make, I'm literally thinking, I must be losing my mind. Uh, uh-huh. Because he would also, he would move things. What about the lies? The lies never add up and makes you feel like you crazy because, wait, did I forget that? No, this is a lie. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 
Here's what's so funny about that. We gave him a nickname, mm -hmm. the Lion King. Oh, shoot. <laughs> See? Wow, good. Good we, one. And he would laugh at it. When we called him the Lion King, he would laugh at it. He didn't know. He didn't care. Oh. He didn't care. Oh, wow. Right? So, so, here, so here I'm going through all of this stuff. And just the fact of, like, I would put something there. He would move it. And I would go, what happened to him? I like, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh. I, I know I put this here. Uh-huh. And so now you start guessing yourself. You're like, gosh, I, have, I don't know. Maybe I need some ginkgo bug. Maybe I need some, you know, something. So then it got a little closer to the end of the year. So now we're at December the 20th. Right. And now we're just, it's just volatile. Right? It's just really bad. And it's going back and forth. Just the, you know, I hate you. I hate you. And, the, you know, I can't wait to get out of here and all that kind of stuff. But it was never physical. Right. Thank it was God never for physical. That but it was just really, really, you know, when people talk about domestic violence, you instantly go to the physical. No, but it is domestic right? violence. Right? Abuse. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. Emotional Abuse. domestic violence can be so much hurtful than the scars. Because mm -hmm. the scars can sometimes go away. It could heal. Right. The, 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 the emotional one remains here. Even years after, you'll click back and say, oh, my God, that person told me that about me. Thank God I got out of that and stopped believing yes. that. Can you yes. start believing it's about yourself? Exactly. Exactly. That's a sad thing. So now here we are. It's December 19th. Packing up, you know, getting things ready to go. And so now he's selling my stuff. <laughs> Really? Sorry, He's I'm not on laughing. Craigslist. At, yeah. He is putting my stuff on Craigslist. Oh. And I pull up to the house and this guy, I had a, you know, the, in the garage, you have extra refrigerator, you know, yes, that yes, kind of yes. stuff. This guy is backing the refrigerator out. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? Well, that was our refrigerator. No, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. You ain't bought nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was my refrigerator. Right. So then I said, okay. So now I'm taking things out because I'm like, when I'm at work, I don't know what he's going to sell, what he's going to do. Mm. So now it's December 21st. So I told my daughter, I said, listen, he's selling my stuff. I can't go to work. So we changed the locks on the door. Ooh. We changed the locks on the door. We disabled the garage door from going up. And I go to the police station. Mm -hmm. And I tell the police, I show them all these text messages. You know, there's, it's never been anything about, oh, I can't wait to get you or anything like that. So there's nothing threatening. Right. Just intimidation. And so I'm showing them, I'm like, look, what can I do? And they're like, well, there's nothing we can do because nothing's really happened. Right. Which is, it's so hurtful when you think about the fact that these are the people that are supposed to protect you proactively before something happens. Yes. And you're telling me you have to wait until something happens. Mm -hmm. And I, I kept going, that doesn't make sense to me. That sounds... Not cutting you, but everyone is crazy right now. Netflix, Jeff Dahmer. Mm -hmm. And that lady begged them. She begged them. Yes. She called the police so many times, even when he took that 14-year-old kid. Yes. You know, even we, we saw that series, but I, doing his documentary, it was the same thing mm -hmm. from the past. It's the same thing. They don't listen. Right. They wait till it happens or it gets bad. And that's bad. Exactly. So they never even come across to just say, hey, this is what's going on. You can't do that or whatever. No, no. Okay. So now it's December 21st. So we're now having this really blown out argument. Right. And I'm talking to my daughter on the phone and she hears him in the background. Mm -hmm. So she calls the police. Uh -huh. So the police come over to the house. Now, mind you, at this time, I was a volunteer for the police department. Uh -huh. So I'm a local volunteer for the police department. So she calls the police. The police officer comes, not one that I recognize. And so we're outside and we're talking. And I'm explaining to him exactly what I've shared with you. We're getting a divorce. You know, our um, lease is up in 30 days. We decided we could stay here for the 30 days so that nobody would have to bear the hardship of paying this stuff by themselves. So, and I'm talking to him. And apparently he sees that there's a police car out front, so he calls another police. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. So he calls the police. Now this police officer gets out the car, goes into the home, and apparently they have a conversation. The police officer comes back out. Now he's interrupting the conversation that I'm having with the police officer that initially came. And he says, did you guys fight? 
I said, no. I said, it was just verbal, like I'm telling this police officer here. He says, he said, you pushed him. Turn around. You're arrested for domestic violence. What? I'm like, what are you talking about? He says, no, you're, you're being arrested for domestic violence. He spins me around. He handcuffs me. Well, wait, 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 one second. What about the other cop? Didn't he speak to him? They didn't have a no. conversation? No. Nah. Okay. No. And this is, this is why I'm like, I was in like this vortex of this is not even happening. I must be dreaming uh -huh. because... I don't go to jail. Right. <laughs> this is, this yeah. is not what I do. Uh -huh. you know, I'm the one that goes to church. I'm the volunteer. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I'm the, you know, I'm the VP. I'm the this. I'm, no, I don't go to jail. So <laughs> here's what the police officer does that I was talking to, though. He says, no, no, I'll take her. Mm -hmm. Because he and I'm looking at him like, you know, this is wrong. Right. You know, this is wrong. But now, after the math, what I find out is once the cop puts the police, the handcuffs on you, they're not going to sit there and argue back and forth, right. right? He has to go with what this police officer said. Now, there should have been communication between the two. Yes. Before he immediately came out, interrupted us, spun me around and put handcuffs on right. me. So I get arrested. So now I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm in the car bawling and the police officer that I was speaking to is the one that said, I'll take her down. He literally takes the car around the corner and he stops. And I know in his heart, he's saying this is wrong. He's saying this is wrong. Now, my mother, who I was caring for, who came to visit for me, uh -huh. came to visit for the holidays, she's still there. Uh -huh. So she's witnessing all of this. And so I, so I get arrested and I, yeah, and I said to them, I said, listen, I don't want to leave my mother in the house with him. Let me call my daughter, let her come and get my, let her come and get her grandmother. Mm -hmm. So the guy says, okay. So I call her and she feels so bad because she's the one that called the police in the first place. So now mm -hmm. she's like, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, no, you are not taking on this. This is not you at all. So I go to jail. <laughs> Mind you, it's Christmas time. So the staff is very slim. <laughs> I am sitting there in jail and I'm getting mug, I'm getting fingerprinted and my mug shot. And I'm like, I'm still like, this isn't happening. <laughs> this is not happening. It's a movie. It's a nightmare. <laughs> Plus, I must be still watching Lifetime. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. <laughs> this is so true. So now this is on a Friday. And so finally they take me back. Now, the only thing I've ever seen about prison is what I've seen on movies. You know, and I've seen the women's correction facilities, and I'm like, this is not a place That's for me. That's how far it went? They, oh. they actually put you in big jail? like? Oh, yeah. County, mm -hmm. not, they put me into the county jail. Wait, wait, wait. One second. So you're telling me they didn't just take you down to the precinct, question you, and, and just have you, like, a little lock oh, up right no. there? Oh, my God. I went to jail. I Straight. Hope, I hope you sued somebody. To jail. Well, here's where it gets uh -huh. interesting. Yeah. Go ahead. So I go to jail. Now, because I was a volunteer police officer, they had tagged me as a police officer. Oh. So <laughs> this is where the reality sets in. So now they're t they've waited for a group of us to be taken in to walk us to where the actual jails are, uh -huh. the cells, rather. So as we're walking down the hall, I'm, I'm now I'm starting to ball. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm really going into a pod with other prisoners. Right. And so there's three people in front of me. So they get to the three people and we're lining up against the wall. And now my heart is like this. Bump, 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 bump. <sighs> and, and I'm like, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I'm really going to jail. I'm going to go into a pod like I see on TV. And I'm like, well, I don't know, what do they do to you in jail, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And so they get to me and they call my name and she says, come this way with me. So I'm like, okay, so I come this way with her. They put me into a cell by myself. I don't realize that I'm in maximum security. Oh my goodness. Yes, I am in maximum security. So I'm in a cell all by myself. And it didn't dawn on me that I was in maximum security till now I'm unloading my toilet paper, my little toothbrush, the little comb that they give you. And on the comb it said maximum security. And I'm like, what am I doing in maximum security? But because they tagged me as a police officer, they didn't want to put me in the pod right, with the right, other right, people. Right. So I'm thinking again, God, thank you. Uh -huh. so you, you, see, you, know, you see these lights are flashing. You've got these buzzers going that mean something to people 
you know, mm-hmm. one buzz or two buzz or whatever it means. And you hear these keys going into locks so that the guards are coming through and passing through. And so you hear all of these and you hear footsteps. Right. And so the next day comes and they take me up to the judge for arraignment. And she says, um, you know, you're released. My bond is like $50. Right. Well, actually, it was 500 but 10% of that, so it's like $50. I'm like, look, I got $50 in my purse downstairs. <laughs> Let me up out of here. Uh-huh. <laughs> so then, um, so I go back to my cell, and they give me the sheet of paper, and I said, so what happens now? So the guard says, well, they'll let you call your family, and somebody can come and get you. So now here it is Saturday, and it's getting late. And I'm going, okay, nobody's coming to tell me anything. So as I hear the guards walking past, I'm going, excuse me, excuse me, I'm supposed to have a phone call. Mm. And they're just walking. And they're like, yeah. And they literally said really snide remarks. (laughs) Like, yeah, right. Or we'll be back. Or when we have time. Things like that. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be stuck here. And the only thing I could think of is my family is trying to get me out because I know they are. Mm -hmm. And they're probably getting like, we don't know where she is. She hasn't gone to arraignment, you know, this runaround. So I'm sitting there and now they give me some, now this time for food. Uh So food comes in. I'm like, I'm not eating this stuff. I'm not going to be here that long. (laughs) But I look and I'm like, you give me food with no utensils. There's no fork. There's no spoon. And it's like some goulash stuff. Uh I'm supposed to eat that with my fingers. Uh So in my mind, I'm like, you bring people in here and you treat them like animals. Mm-hmm. And I'm not even in the prison. Mm-hmm. I'm just in the jail portion of it. And I'm gone. And so I didn't eat it. And I just, you know, I let it sit there. And so when they come and get it, I said, listen, somebody is supposed to give me a phone so I can call myself. I said, look, I got my papers. I can get out of here. So he says, okay, I'll bring you one back. Now hours go by because you never know what time it is. Right. Right? So it's just like a really long time goes by. So I hear somebody coming back through, and now I'm up at the door because I'm like, okay, before they pass me, I need to be able to say, hey, I need a phone. Right. So as I hear the steps coming closer, and I go, I need a phone. I'm supposed to be leaving. Okay, we'll bring you one back. Again. Yes. Uh-huh. So then never get one. I hear somebody else coming through. I hear the, the keys in the lock. And this is how, this is the mentality that you develop. And I'm listening, like, now you're listening for all of these sounds. Right. right? It's like, okay, so that's the key in the lock. That's a guard coming. Coming. You know, those are footsteps. And I'm counting how many steps it takes to get to my cell. Wow. This is, it, it takes you into a different Mental mindset. Mental state. Yes. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So I'm counting how many steps it takes. So when I get to this certain point in the number of steps, I'm like, okay, let me start talking now. So by the time he gets to my, my door, I will have gotten it out, and he will not have passed me by. So I tell this young lady, she was a guy, and I said, listen, please, I am not supposed to be in here this long. I said, look, here are my papers. I just need a phone. Can I just get a phone? So she brings me a phone. Uh-huh. She plugs it in. She puts it in the door, in the door thing, and then she walks off. I pick the phone up. There's no dial tone. And I'm hitting the button. I'm dialing nine. I'm like, there's no dial tone. The phone doesn't work. Uh And she's walked off. So now here I'm sitting, and I'm like, I got hope right here. Uh But the hope is not working. And you go through all of these mental things like, what is going on here? So, again, now I hear keys in the lock again. I'm counting the steps. Listen, I got a phone. It's not working. (laughs) She brought it in here, but there's no dial tone. Uh-huh. And they're like, oh, yeah, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. I'm like, how can you treat people like this? You don't know what I'm in here for. You have no idea. I could have been a traffic stop sign. Yeah. And you're treating me like a criminal that has just done all types of ill will things to people. Wow. You don't know who I am. You have no idea. So another guy, he comes through. Uh-huh. No, I'm sorry, it was another female. She says, okay, I'll take you to use a phone. Thank you. So we go down, we walk, we go into another pod to utilize the phone. So I call, I pick up the phone, and it's just a dial tone. And I'm trying to dial out, and it's a dial tone. 
Now, across from where that pod is, is the, the, um, the correctional officers, I guess like their, their area where they can view everything. I don't know what that's actually called. And I see them over there and they're laughing at inmates. Uh-huh. And I started to cry uh-huh. because I'm going, they find this treatment funny. Funny, yes. And it's so disheartening. And I literally, I started to cry because I'm like, you're laughing at us. Wow. In our deepest despair, this is funny to you. Yep. And you don't know this person is innocent and that's what you're doing to them. Exactly. Yeah. And so I say, the phone doesn't let me out. I mean, it's not giving me a dial tone to call anyone. And so she says, well, maybe your family doesn't care about hearing from you. Oh, shoot. This is what she says. Wow. And I said, what? I said, no, my family will answer my calls. I can't get a call. So then the other guard says, oh, well, you can't dial out because you're not, you're not stationed to this pod. The only people that can use this phone is who? are the people from this pod. I said, uh-huh. so then why did you bring me here? Uh-huh. Why did you why did you bring me out of my cell to tell me you can take me to a phone? I'll give you that. And and you sit here laughing, mm-hmm. knowing that I can't call out because this isn't my pod. But you told them that? Like yeah, right there? Good. Yeah. Okay. So I'm saying this because in my mind I'm like, this isn't right. Mm-hmm. So she walks me back to my cell. Now I'm on the ground, I'm praying. I'm like, Lord, please. I talked to Joseph. I talked to Paul, I talked to David, I talked to everybody in the Bible. Because I'm like, I I don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. This is crazy. I said, but somewhere in here, I feel like I'm supposed to find something. Right. Right. Something, this is transitional. And I'm thinking about Paul being in the jail, Uh you know, and and that experience of what he did for those that were in the prison and how Uh he came out and he was a changed person. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm thinking, well, maybe this is an area, you know, that I'm changing or something. I don't know, because mm-hmm. this is deep. Whatever lesson it is, you had to find out right there. Yeah. Yeah. So after I pray, I'm sitting up now. Now it is, what is it, Sunday morning. Oh. It is the 23rd, two days before Christmas. The only thing I can think of is if I'm here two more days, the uh-huh. staff is going to get scarce and nobody's going to pay me any attention. Mm-hmm. They're not going to let me out of here. And I will have been here about a week. Wow. So here it is Sunday morning. I hear the gates open. I hear the, the key lock again. Mm-hmm. Right now I'm up at the door. I'm waiting for this, the, whoever it is. And the guy, the, the correctional officer comes through and I'm like, please. I said, can you please help me? I said, I am not supposed to be here. I've been to the arraignment. They're supposed to let me go. The person brought me a phone. It didn't work. (coughs) Took me to the pod. It didn't work. He said, I will bring you a phone back. He said, I can't do it, though, until 730. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking in my head, he's lying, too. He's not going to bring me a phone back. So he leaves. I hear the keys open up the gate again. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, please, God, let it be him. It was him. Uh huh. He brought you back. He brought me a phone. He stood there and waited for the phone to be operable. And I looked at the name on his badge and I said, Officer Johnson, thank you. Oh. I said, you were sent here today because I have spoken to many of COs here and they had no respect for human kindness. Wow. And I said, thank you. He said, I will come back and get you. He said, I'm going to go see about your getting out of here, and I will come back and get you. And I said, thank you. So I call my mother. I call my, my, uh, my friend, my daughter, and they're like, we've been trying to get to okay. you. While you were saying this story about the day before when they were doing you that, I know in my head your people been trying to get you. And that means they know because they're laughing. So they know they've been trying to get you. Yeah. And they're like, we have been out there three times and nobody would let us see you because their name wasn't on the list for visitors. (laughs) I'm like, nobody asked me about a visitor's list. I wasn't even supposed to be here. Exactly. So they're saying, we're outside. Oh my God. And so I said, okay. So now the, the officer, he comes back. He says, I need to take you to get your ankle bracelet on. 
because my husband did a full victim's packet on me. Like he was in danger of his life. Wow. So I have to have on an ankle bracelet. Wow. I go get the ankle bracelet put on. And they give me all the instructions, you know, yada, 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 yada. I'm like, just, okay, fine, just let me out of here. So as I'm coming out to be released, I asked one of the guards, because I came in and I had money. Right. You know, I had money in my purse, I had, and you have to deposit it, and they give you a receipt. Right. So I asked the guard, I said, okay, so what happens to the money that I had? She laughs at me and says, oh, you pay to go to jail. It's like, what? <laughs> she says, yeah, you pay to stay in jail. I'm like, that's crazy. Okay, fine, just let me out of here. So I leave. Now it's starting to get really serious because mm-hmm. he's really, he went to the state attorney's office. He's really <laughs> trying to ruin my life. <laughs> uh-huh. He has gone into my, into my, um, my computer. Uh-huh. He's taken my arrest record, emailed it to my business mentor. He emailed it to some of my business contacts. And I literally had to start telling people, like if I had met you, I would say, Raj, you're going to probably get an email or a text message. Yeah. Stay out of it. Yeah. Okay, because this is what's going on. And they were like, okay, Cheryl, fine. So as we're going through this, I'm like, this is going to be dropped because this is just stupid. Yeah, yeah. But he's pressing full on charges. Now, I can't go back to my home Mm -hmm. because I've been put out because he's there. And I can't go within 500 feet of my home. So (laughs) I take my, I got two dogs and my mother (laughs) and we're homeless. And my mother's like, I'm not leaving you. She's like, I'm not going back home and you're here like this. I'm not leaving you. So my girlfriend takes us all in. She's got a condo. So she's got, so it's me, her, my mom, my two dogs, her dog. Oh my God. (laughs) All in her condo. And so I have literally now reverted to the bedroom. I'm just like, this is crazy. And I'm looking at this ankle bracelet with this blinking light. Yeah. And I'm like, this, I, I don't even understand this. Yeah. I don't even understand this. Here's, here's, here's something that, an experience that I remember during that time. For Christmas, I had bought my mom and myself two tickets to see Diana Ross. Oh. Uh-huh. That was her Christmas present. So as we're going to the concert, I put on pants because I have on this ankle bracelet. So I put on this beautiful outfit with these nice flare pants and we go to this beautiful center Mm -hmm. and my mom's in a wheelchair. So as I'm pushing her through the entrance to the wheelchair, the metal detector goes off Uh and the guy goes, can you come over here? So I'm trying to be discreet because the metal detector goes off. You know, everybody's looking like, oh, what happened? What's going on? So I I tell him, I said, listen, I have on an ankle bracelet. He says, I have to see it. Uh So you have to pull your pants up to see it and everybody's looking, right? That right there Broke. was the moment that I was crushed. I was so crushed. I was, I was humiliated. I was embarrassed. I felt bad for my mother. And I felt bad because I'm like, what are people saying about this situation? Because they're going to think I'm a bad person. Mm-hmm. Because here I am with an ankle bracelet on. That only mm-hmm. happens to bad people in, mm-hmm. the, in the normal person's mind. Mm-hmm. And that's all I could think about was, wow, <laughs> this is like taking me to the depths of the lowest that I could possibly have even thought of. So we go to the concert. So we come back to the, to the apartment and, you know, it, this thing is starting to catapult. He's texting me. See, you did this to yourself. What? <laughs> Are you serious? Mm-hmm. Right? So then, <clears throat> as I, as I, he's starting to say, you know, yes, and I'm going to make sure I take everything from you. And I'm mm-hmm. like, I need to get a lawyer. Mm-hmm. Because this is not going away. Mm-hmm. So I get a lawyer. He's, he's just full on pressing charges. And the lawyer's like, he's not dropping this. He's not dropping this. So... As I'm waiting that out, again, I'm in this bedroom Uh and I got the blinds down. I'm in bed because I'm like, I'm emotionally drained and I'm mentally fried Mm -hmm. and I'm like, I'm done. I just just don't even want to be here anymore. And you know, you, there's these moments in time where 
a situation that happened to you, mm -hmm. when you don't allow it to define you, something shows you something. Mm -hmm. And you regain who you are. That little bright light. Yes. Yeah. And I was thumbing through a magazine. And I'm a huge, you know, uh, affirmation person, you know, the motivational quotes, the motivational uh -huh. podcast. This is who I am. That's who I was. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thumbing through this magazine. Now, mind you, I had been in this bed just like crying and the dogs are in there licking my face because they know I'm sad. <laughs> and I'm in this state for almost a week and a half. I'm not eating. I'm just, you know, and she's like, oh, Cheryl, come on, eat. You got to do that. I'm like, no, I don't want anything. I want this to end. That's uh -huh, all I want. Uh -huh. I want this to end. I want my life back. Yeah. So long story short, my lawyer ends up getting the case dropped from the state attorney's office because the one thing that that police officer did not do was take my mother's statement who was in the house when all of this happened. Ooh. Had they taken her statement initially when he said I pushed him? She would have said, no, it didn't happen. Right. I, was, I was right here. They never took her statement. So I had to have her write a statement. The, my lawyer took it to the state attorney's office. They dropped the case. Right. I'm walking the dogs because now I'm like, I just need to go for walks. And that's all I did. When I came out, I just walked the dogs. And we went through the trail, the, you know, this trail, that trail. So I get back and I get, as I'm walking the dogs, I get a phone call from the jail saying, come and get your ankle bracelet off. Tears start streaming down my eyes in the state attorney's office. That's who it was. Said, we've dropped the case. Yeah. Tears start streaming down my eyes. I go back to the house, and um, right before then, I was sharing with you, I was thumbing through a magazine. Right. This one quote that I saw is what made me get up and go outside and take the dogs for a walk. I'll never forget it. It was by Layla Delilah. And it said, when she remembered who she was, the game changed. And I kept saying that. When she remembered who she was, the game changed. And, and, and I say this to you, right? You're going, you might be going through some things. Remember who you are. Because that changes the game. It changes what people can do to you. It changes what people can can say to you and affect you, it changes how you think about yourself. Mm -hmm. Because you are worthy, you are enough, and you are truly worthy of your success. Amazing. And that got me up. I immediately changed the name of my business to Rise and Shine. Nice. I looked in the mirror. I said, girl, I dare you. I dare you to rise and shine. <laughs> and that's how my business got its name. Rise and Shine. That's Love how it, it got its name. And then from that point on, I've just been, everything I've done has just been to say, girl, you are worthy. You are. You are enough. And the success that you are accomplishing is because you worked your butt off. Amazing. You've overcome. You've put in the time. You've put in the work. And even on those rough days when things go wrong, I still have my, um, I have a vision board that I do every year. Right. And my vision board is my screensaver. Nice. So I look at it every single day. Beautiful. And that's what drives me because one of the quotes on there is from the Bible. It was from um, Psalms 1431, I believe. But it says, as for me, I will always have hope. <laughs> and you did. And that's what got me. You never lose hope, Troll. That's an amazing thing, too. Right? Yeah. That's what got me to where I am now. You know, and what I do, I say I grew up in my profession, uh -huh. but before you can do the profession, you have to have the mindset, Yes. right? And sometimes we get so beaten down, you know, by things that have happened to us and we allow those things to define our capabilities. And who you are. Right. And so I started a movement and mm -hmm. it's called Affirm Your Truth. Affirm your truth. Affirm your truth. And the, the, the mantra is to be unapologetically bold, to be confident as you move beyond your fear, walk into what might seem impossible, knowing that it's not mm -hmm. because you are enough and you are worthy of your success. Amazing. You hear that? 
that's so amazing you see how it is and you hear the dark place she was in i didn't expect this like <laughs> that's why i told you at break we was having breakfast this morning both of us she i'm supposed to check out at 12 and i tell she's that telling me oh well i have a story and i said no stop right there you're gonna tell it live and i love this i mean even though I, I'm broken. Like, for you, I put myself mm. in that place. And I'm going to tell you this. I'm sorry to say it like this, but you live maybe what I could have gone through. Mm -hmm. And another thing is, that thing with the ankle bracelet, if you know you're innocent with something, you don't give up anything. Don't give or care about what I always teach all of you. That change in that bottle, that make noise as people talking, you do not care about them. It's what's in here. As long as you know you're innocent and you mm -hmm. know you're truthful and honest to yourself, that's all that matters. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry that you really had to go through that. I know it made you stronger and you will mm -hmm. look back because the same way I look back at things and I, I smile about it. We, we yes. don't have to be hurt or cry about it anymore, but we went through that and it made us who we are. And wow. Yeah. And you can look back at it now, and I jokingly tell the story yeah, now, yeah, as yeah. you know, there were times where I was laughing or smiling, yes. because that's how I've had to deal with yes, it. Yes, exactly. But then the emotions still come up, and sometimes I hear it in my throat, and I'm like, okay, Cheryl, you're getting ready to cry. <laughs> I, I don't know. It's, and then people will say, if you tell your story like that, and you talk to someone else, who doesn't understand what it, it means to heal, they'll be like, oh, you need to go and heal. You need to do this. No, mm -hmm. we heal. We moved on. Yeah. When we have to tell this for you to understand that if you reach that part or you're going through this, it means to say, hey, you are not alone. Mm -hmm. And it will hurt you at a point because it happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and, and the, 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 you know, the piece about it that's so um, integral is that the aftermath, you asked, what did I do after right. it? I wrote the Department of Corrections. Beautiful. This I is wrote what the I sheriff. For. I wrote the sheriff uh -huh. of uh, my township. Yes. I no longer volunteered for the police department. Right. Because I said, I don't trust you all anymore. Beautiful. You know, and, and the captain of the corrections actually called me back. And she said, you know what, I am so sorry that that happened to you. Mm -hmm. She said, and I tell the guards all the time, you don't know why people are in here. Yes, this is so true. It could have been mistaken identity. It could have been just a traffic violation. You cannot treat everybody as if they've done some heinous crime. Or something, yes, exactly. Right? And so I felt good about that because yeah. I felt like I did my part. Yes. I didn't let this go. Right. right. I did my part. She did her part by reading the letter, reaching back out to me and say, I am sorry that that happened to you. And then from that, she also said, we've changed some of our processes. Right. Because in the intake aspect, they keep calling you up to the desk and they ask you the same questions, all the same over. questions over and over and over again to where you get frustrated. You're like, I keep telling you my name. Yeah. I keep telling you this, you know, and she says, we've stopped doing that. So I feel like I made some difference, and maybe that's why I was there. I don't know if that was a piece of it. Of your purpose. Right. Yes. You know, to just bring some things to light. Because think about it, if you did do these heinous crimes, and right. you write somebody a letter saying they mistreated you, they're like, yeah, we get that all the time. But when you get that from a person that's never been to jail, that's never... Um, Have any you know, kind of they, record. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And they were a volunteer for the police department. Yeah. You have to say, well, this person has got to be telling the truth. Or well, something right there is supposed to have some lines to draw mm -hmm. to say, hey, wait, let's check into this. Let's look into this a little bit more. Yeah. There's more to this. That's it. Yeah. Exactly. You know, and the other thing that, that I'll share is when you tell a lie, <laughs> When you tell a lie on an individual, it can change their life because not only did it change my life personally, he called my job and told them I was arrested and I lost my job behind that. As I was at work with an ankle bracelet on with my pants on, mm. my director came in and said, you know, let me speak to you. And I had spoken to him before when all of this was happening and said, right. look, you might get a phone call. And so I was disappointed in him right, because you right. were forewarned. Right, right. And now you, you spineless 
right, played into this, and you were manipulated by mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. master manipulator. Mm -hmm. But the, the thing that really got me was when people tell lies on another person, mm -hmm. you don't know what effect that's going to have on their life because you just cut off my livelihood. Yep. You know, and especially for something like domestic violence. <laughs> that's huge. And when you accuse somebody of it that it didn't happen, what it does is it makes it bad for those that it really happens to. Two. Exactly. That's, that's true. Another thing too, when you lie about someone or you don't know the depth of what someone is trying to explain to you or tell you, and you destroy a person's character. Mm -hmm. And a person's character, they take forever to build because you're not, as you said, to be who you are, it's happened from a child. Keep molding you from a child mm -hmm. coming up. And you just, in one snap of a finger, that's gone. Right. Because the whole world, society, everyone starts looking at you in a different eye. And that's a sad thing about it. Yeah. Because then he went to social media, and every time oh. I would post something, he would say, you know, she's been arrested for domestic violence. Oh, wow. And I had to shut off all of my social media. Wow. I had to change all of that. It was like every time I would put up a YouTube post for my business. These right. are business right. things. Right, right, he would, His comments would be, yes, yeah, you know she's been arrested for domestic violence. You know she's been arrested for domestic violence. And so I had to block him, block him, block him. I even wrote a letter to his mother saying, look, this is what your son did. And then I said, I even sent her like the description of narcissism. Uh -huh. I said, he needs mental health. Yes. Because what people don't understand about narcissism is that there is no diagnosis. <laughs> right? There is no, there is is no medical diagnosis for it. And a narcissist is not going to go get treated because they don't believe that they are. Even if, if, if you show them and point it out to them, you need help. You need to sit with a psychiatrist or psychologist. Mm -hmm. They're going to be like, it's you. Exactly. If you tell them they're bipolar, you're bipolar. If you tell them what's wrong with you, they're going to say, it's wrong with you. Mm -hmm. You are the problem. Always. It's never their fault. It's always about you. Exactly. It's sad. Exactly. Very sad. So don't let that happen and don't bear that weight. Release yourself mm -hmm. from that, knowing that it is not you and you cannot be responsible for another person's ability to love themselves. Beautiful. Wow. If they don't love themselves, you can't make a person love themselves. You can't change a person into loving you better or loving themselves better. We like to think that we can change people. I'm going to help him get yeah. better. Oh. <laughs> no, you can't. You cannot oh. help a person get better that doesn't even see that they're ill. Well, I was in a place where I, this is what I said, and I had someone, my best friend, she was like, it's not up to you, because I was like, listen, okay, all right, if I don't do it, or I don't put up with it, that means someone else has to go through that hell, and I know I'm strong enough to do this, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe they'll change, maybe they'll do this differently. But that's not up to you. Let that person go. Let those people go. Because not one person can be like that in your life. You could have multiple of them. Mm -hmm. Let them go. You just need to do you. That's it. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and you know, the other thing that I did from that, and this here is, is my final words to you. Every morning when you wake up, look in the mirror and say, I love you. Ah, Ralph tells you guys that all the time. A woman told me that day, oh, I don't need to wait till I go to, um, wait till I get up and go look at myself in the mirror. That's not true. Yeah, you get up, you, you breathe, you tell God, thank you, you wake up, whatever. You go to the bathroom, watch yourself because it's you. And mm -hmm. you love yourself. I love mm -hmm. that. Thank you, Cheryl, for saying Absolutely. that. Absolutely. But Cheryl, Absolutely. we're not done. I want you to tell these people how amazing you are and what you do and where to find you and everything. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, I, I help people rewire. I help people rewire how they think. Nice. And that's an empowerment. It's empowerment. Now, I take that and I couple it with business, but my philosophy is if it works in business and you're successful, use it in your personal life. Of course. Beautiful. Because we try to create balance. There's no balance. Mm -hmm. You cannot create balance because you're trying to focus on one thing, then you're leaving something out and you're always off. Yes. But you can integrate. You can integrate. You can live in harmony with your work life, your professional life, your career. Aspect. 
of what I do. I do wear the two hats. My other hat is for women's empowerment because I want you to be unapologetically bold. I want you to love who you are. I want you to love what you are about to accomplish. And you see, I use my words intentionally. I want you to choose words wisely. And that's the other element of everything that I teach is the choice, the words that we utilize when we refer to ourselves, when we refer to our goals, when we refer to our life. Amazing. The words that you use bear weight. So be very intentional about words that you use. And I help people come across, you know, that, that gap. There's a gap from where you are to where you want to be. Mm -hmm. And I help you get through that gap by working with you, alongside of you. I am a consultant and a coach, and I don't think you can separate the two. Because people need consulting, but they also need to know that there are things in their habits, there are things in their daily routines that they can do that will allow them to improve what they do and to feel good about the momentum that they're generating. So I work with sales teams, I work with corporates, I work with individuals, and it's all on that same method. It's mindset first, then it's methods, and then it's sustainability. That way, you get it, you learn it, you implement it, but you keep it going because it's about continuous improvement. And nice. every day, we are successful. And it's celebrating those wins because there are no small wins, a win is a win. You're celebrating those wins because that gets you to go, I got this, I can do this, I can keep moving forward. And sometimes we don't, we don't celebrate. I, I celebrate every day. I love it, I love, like, I did so many interviews since I was here, mm -hmm. and everyone has a different message. But sitting here with you today, I mean, I listened to you, you how you put together your plan when we listened to you at, at this speech, and um, it, what, I tell them all the time, all my rasters, the same thing. When you accomplish something, give yourself a little pat on the back mm -hmm. because you deserve it. You, you, as she said, celebrate you because you made an accomplishment, no matter how small it is. If it is that you all follow me, you listen to all these, these stories and you still need help, please contact Cheryl. If you don't listen to Ra, contact Cheryl if you think I'm a guy, because I get a lot of messages, mixed mm -hmm. messages, either from guys, girls, female, male, anybody, telling me their stories, their problems, asking me questions. Mm -hmm. But some people might feel that like they don't want to open up to me because sure. some people might know me. Contact Cheryl. The same way I had um, a good friend, she's an author, Vina Jackman, she's also a coach, mm -hmm. and my own people will be like, message me, can I have Vi's number? Or can I ask her? her information is right there. Just like Cheryl information is going to be underneath here as well. Mm -hmm. All her information. Please, feel free to contact her. And anyone in, has a business and it's failing or you think that something needs improving, please contact her because she is definitely going to help you. It's not, she's not about money. Trust me. I mean, people have to get paid for their services and whatever, but she will go out of her way for you. And you, some of you really need that. Absolutely. Um, and I'm available on all of social media, uh, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. The name? Uh, yes, Cheryl Mays. And um, Instagram, it's Rise, Rise and Shine, and shine. CF. <laughs> Beautiful. So you can definitely connect with me there. Um, but my final word, my very last word is believe in yourself.